Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started just in the interest of time. We have a lot of updates this evening, and we're just so thankful that you all um, can join us tonight. And we had, a, we had another town hall that we hosted at four o'clock. I see some familiar faces on this call as well. So thanks for joining us back. Um, you know, there's a lot of different ways that we can communicate with our supporters and with our community. Certainly um, one of the nicest ways is one-on-one -on -one stewardship and getting to know each community member. That's certainly a really nice way to get to know folks. Um, we also try to communicate by sending out our, our monthly um, e-newsletter. We, we post very often on, um, we, on a daily basis, we, we have social posts. Um, and then we also try to survey our community when we can, when that makes sense. That's an important thing to do. Um, but there is nothing quite like these town halls. When you can't be out and about and seeing people on a regular basis or at events, you know, regularly scheduled events, a town hall creates a forum that is really um, quite powerful and special. So we're just so grateful that you all could join us tonight. And we're, we're very eager to spend this next hour or so with you. I do want to share with you up front that the last town hall did take us about 90 minutes. So um, if you have the time and can stay with us, we certainly welcome you to. We would love for you to. Um, but we, we will certainly try to get through some of the updates more swiftly than others. Uh, but we do have a lot of important updates for you this evening. So I'm Sam Masterson. I am the CEO for MGFA. I have been the uh, new leader of the organization for the last six months. And I have been able to get to know, know some of you over time, um, but it certainly has been very challenging given the circumstances with the pandemic. We have not been able to get out and see each other. And for that, I am very sorry. Um, the great thing that you're gonna hear tonight is that we've been able to maintain business um, as much as possible. We're very proud of that fact. And um, we have a lot of exciting things to, to share tonight. So a couple things um, off the top that I do wanna just let you guys know, a couple of housekeeping items. Um, you, you did join a waiting room when you first called in and then we have everybody on mute. And um, we have a reason for that. This is a very big call with a lot of uh, attendees. So it's very difficult to present when you hear background noise. So um, don't mean to offend anybody, not, don't have you on mute to be rude. It's just the easiest way to conduct these calls. Um, we highly encourage you to use the chat for sure. Please use the chat. Any questions you have or feedback you have, just, just put it in there. Um, we did ask for questions to be submitted in advance. We do have those questions. They all were medical in nature. So Dr. Buchdahl, who's joining us tonight, is actually going to answer all of those questions. Um, and then as follow-up to these town halls, we will send out all of the materials including the slides and all of the questions that we receive with, with all the answers, of course, you will get all of that. So we will make sure you have that as part of um, the follow-up. And then please know, in addition to all of that, that we don't have to wait for town halls. We can reach out to each other at any time. Um, please always feel free to reach out to the staff at any time um, to give feedback, to ask questions, or we just would love to get to know you, you each, each and every one of you. <laughs> that just takes time. So please, please feel free to do that. Um, so tonight, just to give you a little, a little um, heads up on what we're going to talk about, you're going to get some updates on research, um, some updates on our fundraising event, um, some programmatic updates, and you're going to hear from our four board officers um, a little bit on the strategic plan and the future for MGFA and what's, what really excites them around that strategic plan in the future. Um, so we really are very thankful that they're going to join us this evening, and I'll make introductions to them um, later on. I hope you really enjoy the town hall tonight. And uh, more importantly, I hope that you see yourselves in the updates. Um, this is our organization, our MGFA. This is our community. And this is our future that we're talking about. Um, so with uh, no further ado, I am going to transition over to Dr. Jeff Gupto, who um, is with Duke University. He's a board member. He is also the chair of MGFA's Medical and Scientific Advisory Board. So Jeff, it's all yours. Okay, can you guys uh, see my screen? No slides yet, Jeff. Okay, let's try this again. Okay, now can you see them? Yes. Okay, great. Okay. 
Well, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us this evening. Um, as uh, Sam mentioned, um, I'm a neuromuscular specialist uh, at Duke University. And today I'm gonna be uh, taking you through the active areas of research that MGFA is uh, supporting at the current time. Um, so fortunately, uh, myasthenia research is a very active uh, area currently, particularly in the clinical trial space, and we don't have time to cover all of it, but we wanted to um, let you all know about um, what types of activities, what type of research that the MGFA is, is supporting at, at the current time. And so we'll talk about um, several different programs that the MGFA supports. So the first are pilot grants, which have, has been an active program for, for many years, as has the, the second bullet here, the American Brain Foundation um, collaboration for developing the next generation of scientists who will study myasthenia gravis. More recently, the MGFA um, has uh, started supporting a rare disease clinical research network that is supported by the National Institute of Health that's called MGNET. And there are two programs in particular that are part of MGNET that uh, the MGFA supports. And then we'll also talk about what's on the horizon in terms of uh, the research that the MGFA is, is supporting. And it's important to note that this research is really uh, possible because of the efforts of a lot of the people that are um, taking the time to be on this town hall meeting. Um, this research comes, uh, is, is possible because of donations um, uh, from patients as well as volunteer activism and participation in a lot of uh, the fundraising activity that, that um, the MGFA uh, does. So for each of these, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about what each of the investigators uh, is doing. Um, and I'm intentionally uh, putting faces to like the names here. So you kind of hopefully over time, we'll, we'll be able to get to uh, recognize or know some of the people that are actively working in the space to uh, make the lives of uh, patients with MG better. So the, the first active grant um, is by Dr. David Richmond, who's at the University of California, Davis. And his research program is focused on developing the next generation of highly selective therapies for myasthenia. So as many, as you, as many of you know, the medications that we use now, though often effective, uh, are, can be limited by side effects. And those side effects can, can be because we are um, suppressing the immune system more widely than just the, the, the very specific underlying problem um, that patients with MG have. And so Dr. Richmond is trying to approach this by adapting a treatment uh, approach that has been uh, successful in certain forms of cancer. And that is to use the patient's own immune system to very selectively uh, destroy the cells that are producing the antibodies that cause the muscle weakness in myasthenia. So down in the, um, in the right hand corner here, um, there are a couple very important cell types that are active in myasthenia. We have T cells and B cells. And the T cells, one of their jobs is to uh, interact with these B cells to get them to activate and to produce antibodies to attack things. And in the, in the normal situation, this attack is directed against uh, viruses and bacteria and things like that. But uh, in the case of myasthenia, the body is of course attacking itself, uh, in particular the muscle, and these antibodies are attacking the muscle. The approach that Dr. Richmond is uh, proposing um, in, this, uh, in this first stage of research to try to prove that this type of approach might work is to adapt this for an animal model of myasthenia, where you give the, the animal um, uh, myasthenia, and then afterwards you take their own T cells 
and engineer them to selectively attack the B cells that cause the, uh, produce the antibody and cause the weakness. And so by doing that, um, the, the idea is that the antibodies will get eliminated and the disease will get better. So this approach uh, will be used first in an animal model. And then if successful, then it could be advanced um, later on down the road to human studies. And one of the real significant aspects of this project is that uh, it is so selective that it, um, it leaves the rest of the immune system to do its job the way it normally should. And so this could be a very significant advance, not only for myasthenia, but for other autoimmune diseases. The second project is not for the um, autoimmune form of myasthenia, but for a rarer form of myasthenia that's caused by gene mutations. And this is called congenital myasthenia. There are various forms of congenital myasthenia that are caused by different mutations in the genetic code, um, but all of them result in weakness. Um, currently, there is really no treatment for any of these um, congenital myasthenias other than to try symptomatic uh, therapy like pyridostigmine that many of you may take, as well as um, other forms of supportive care. So Dr. Maselli at UC Davis is trying to develop a, uh, an approach that um, will correct the gene defect uh, in these patients. And so this is a mouse study. So the first step is to see if we can, if this approach will work um, in an animal model, of course, before we would ever um, try this type of therapy for humans. And so here they're using a very um, special um, uh, form of virus that likes to go into the motor, uh, motor nerves. It doesn't, it doesn't cause any problems, but it, it likes to go into the motor nerves and it's being used as a delivery vehicle kind of like a Trojan horse to bring the, the good copy of the gene into the, into the nerve that'll hopefully lead to the correction of the weakness. So we can see uh, here that we have a, a mouse that has a genetic mutation that's been bred. It's very weak. You um, provide the therapy, which includes the gene that's encoded within this virus that's given into the mouse it goes into, into the nerve and hopefully the weakness that the mouse uh, experiences will get better. If this approach works, it could also be used for other forms of congenital myasthenia. So it wouldn't just be limited to this specific one that, that he is um, targeting with this, uh, this therapy. And this type of approach is currently an investigation for other neuromuscular diseases as well. The third project um, is actually one of, my, uh, one of my projects. And here I mentioned T cells earlier, and there are many different flavors of T cells. And so there are uh, so, some T cells uh, that um, minimize inflammation and others that uh, really try to promote it. And so one of these um, groups that really promotes inflammation are called Th17 cells. And it is well known that this group of cells is, <laughs> is very active in myasthenia. And from prior research in cancer, it's known that these inflammatory um, Th17 cells have a very specific energy requirement. <clears throat> and so the goal of this project is to see whether that energy requirement is also uh, present in autoimmune diseases like myasthenia. And if it is, it opens up a new target for us to develop therapies that can hopefully shut off this metabolism pathway um, and knock down the disease activity very selectively. The next project <laughs> is from Dr. Amanda Guidon. Uh, who is at um, Harvard Medical School. And so her research um, project is looking at developing novel ways to uh, assess myasthenia beyond what we currently do in the clinic. Many of you are, are familiar with the clinical exam that we will do at the bedside, pushing and pulling on you. 
and oftentimes questionnaires, um, which, are, which are good and very helpful, but we think that with some of the new technologies that are available, we can uh, do this even better. And so Dr. Guidon's project is to try to adapt some common technologies um, for use um, in specialized examinations for myasthenia patients. And I'll just mention um, one of these now. One of, one of these is to use a smartphone or tablet to record the voices of, of patients with myasthenia to see if they have slurred speech and actually to measure the degree of slurred speech that they have. And so this could be a way for us to more accurately measure um, another aspect of myasthenia that currently is very difficult for us to, to measure accurately and could lead um, to better ways to monitor patients and uh, identify situations where um, patients may need to contact their medical providers or you know, uh, seek additional attention. So those are the pilot projects. <laughs> and now we're gonna move to a collaboration between the MGFA and the American Brain Foundation. The American Brain Foundation is a phil philanthropic uh, organization that's associated with the American Academy of Neurology. And for many years, this group has been uh, focused on uh, developing the next generation of scientists. And the MGFA is also um, part of this effort. And so they, MGFA and the American Brain Foundation have partnered for these um, awards that are very specialized to help the careers of people who are interested in studying myasthenia. So you can imagine the impact of helping someone very early in their career to get started in research, get their feet under them, and hopefully that leads into um, a long-term um, career over decades. And I'm actually one of those people. I was the first <laughs> recipient of, of this particular award. And so Dr. Raja, who's um, at Duke University, and myself and Dr. Sanders, uh, Don Sanders at Duke are her mentors for this. Her project, in addition to getting training in, in clinical research methods, is to look at the real world of how um, patients are, are treated. And so um, one of the goals of her project is to look at how thymectomy um, is being performed in the United States. There are lots of um, uh, publications and, and information that's available for individual centers, but it's not really clear how these procedures are being done throughout the United States and North America. And so she's gonna analyze a database to look at how these procedures are being done um, and to look at the outcomes of patients um, with a different um, uh, tech, surgical approaches for doing these types of surgeries. The second part of her project is to look at how, um, how useful intravenous immunoglobulins or IVIG is for, the, for treating um, myasthenia gravis um, over the long term. So IVIG, which many of you are familiar with, has been studied more in the acute setting. So for people that have exacerbations or aren't doing well, it's used to rapidly to um, get their disease under control. But a lot of patients um, are actually treated with IVIG over the long term, and there isn't as much data on how successful that is. So that's one of the goals of her project is to um, use a couple different uh, studies or registries to look at how IVIG is doing and how patients fare with those therapies compared to other existing treatments. Now we're going to turn to the Rare Disease Clinical Research Network for Myasthenia, which is called MGNET. And as I mentioned, this is an NIH-supported um, program, but the N an NIH-supported program, but the MGFA pro also provides some support for certain projects that are being done or programs that are being done within MGNET. And I'm going to highlight two of those. One is the MGNET Scholar Program, which is actually very similar to the one that I was just mentioning, the partnership with the American Brain Foundation. And this one is to support the careers, the early careers of investigators who are interested in studying myasthenia and to get them the skills that they need to be able to turn this into a long-term career. 
So um, the first aw awardee this year was um, Dr. Guidon. And so this program will support um, uh, part of her salary as well as part of her research costs and her costs of training um, and travel if she needs to um, learn specific skills and provides mentorship for more experienced um, researchers to help her you know, create projects and, and develop her career path. Her primary mentor for this um, project is um, Dr. Chip Howard, James Howard from um, University of, uh, of North Carolina. And in this project, they're going to look at um, how the feasibility and outcomes for telemedicine and myasthenia. And um, to me, this is one of the most ironic um, projects that has been funded by the MGFA because this, was, this program was actually funded before the pandemic started. And so it was extremely timely and fit in perfectly with what is actually happening in the world right now, where we have rapidly transitioned to a telemedicine environment and we need the information from, from Dr. Guidon and Dr. Howard to be able to manage our patients um, better. And so some of the things that they're interested in looking at are, you know, how, how do we do, like in a big picture, how do we do telemedicine effectively for, for patients with myasthenia? How should we assess patients? Obviously, we have to do, change some things because we can't, um, you know, do our, our normal bedside exam pushing and pulling on people. Are there other measurements that we could be taking that, that would approximate what we do in clinic or could even be better? And what are the obstacles to seeing patients in a telemedicine environment? And I think that there's a lot of optimism that um, these telemedicine approaches, if, if we can optimize them, will be uh, applicable even beyond the pandemic, um, for, particularly for patients who can't travel very well or have to travel long distances in certain situations. And finally, the next project here is, um, this is a pilot grant, which is very similar to the pilot program that the MGFA has on their own. But this one, again, is in partnership with, with the MGNet. And here, um, the awardee was um, Dr. Carolina Barnett Tapia from University of Toronto. And she's been focused over her career on looking at how the patients experience myasthenia and to, uh, you know, to be able to measure that and, uh, and understand the differences in how um, uh, myasthenia gravis patients experience their symptoms and the side effects from their treatments, and to compare that with how the, the doctors see that. Um, because you're probably not surprised, <laughs> not all the time, do the doctors and, and the patients see things exactly the same in terms of how things impact their, their life. So um, this, um, this pilot award um, will examine um, some of those areas in, in more detail. And we think that this will have an impact on how tr actually trials will be done in the future. And so what's next? So, um, you know, th this is, uh, I've only gone through like a small slice of, of what's happening um, within MGFA and there's always new things on, on the horizon and other activities uh, that are ongoing like clinical trials. And so there'll be plenty of time <laughs> for additional uh, updates uh, in the future. And so a couple things that are um, in the works right now is that there's another round of pilot research um, grant funding with nine grants that are under review, which is an excellent number. Actually, there were more submitted, but those are the nine um, ones that were rated the best uh, initially. So those are under review now. And there's also a special research uh, grant opportunity uh, for um, studying patients without an detectable antibodies, um, the proteins in the blood, like the acetylcholine receptor antibodies. And so this, this patient group that doesn't have the antibodies hasn't been studied as much. Uh, and so this is a great opportunity to increase our knowledge in this area. And the MGFA also supports a scientific session every year and this year um, it will take place on October 3rd and we share um, lots of the uh, ongoing research um, that you know, stimulates new ideas and, and, and the, next, uh, you know, the next projects that'll be coming down the road. And then finally, um, there is a, um, a very uh, impactful guideline 
um, that was supported by the MGFA called the International Consensus Guidance for the Management of Myasthenia Gravis. And this particular guidance statement um, has been used internationally um, uh, for um, guiding uh, clinicians as well as drug development on how to treat um, myasthenia gravis patients. And now this um, uh, guidance statement, which was supported by, my, by the MGFA, is several years old and is um, in the process of being updated. And I think we're all um, very much looking forward to, to those updates coming through. So I will um, stop there and we can see if there are any questions. Yes, we have some questions that were submitted in advance and it looks like um, Danielle has asked a similar question to what we received in advance, uh, Jeff. It's about COVID-19. Um, she said that she heard that many research centers were asked to put their research on hold in favor of aiding in research of COVID-19. Are the MG trials active in light of the pandemic? Yeah, so th th that's a really good question. So um, in the, the simple answer is yes. Most trials have, have reactivated. Um, some of it may depend somewhat on where you are and how bad, uh, how much activity there, there is for COVID-19 um, in a particular city or, or state. But in general, yes, most of the studies um, have reopened again. We went, um, we went on hold for recruitment of new patients for a while, but um, we're active again. So, and I anticipated that um, this question may came up. So we, we have, I have another slide here that um, talks about um, COVID-19 and myasthenia. And so it's really hard. This is a very common question that we get from lots of patients. Um, and it, at the current time, it's very hard for us to, to know because we don't have a lot of data to support um, making recommendations one way or the other. And so one of the ways that we've tried to address this is to um, establish a registry to um, uh, collect uh, cases of patients with myasthenia who have gotten COVID-19 to see how they do. Um, and so we're encouraging people all over the world to submit these cases so that we can learn more about this and you know, uh, be able to more effectively and accurately um, talk to patients about risk and, and things like that. So to date, I'm just going to share with you some of the data that's, that's been collected to date. Um, uh, 68 um, patients have been reported to the registry. And just as a side note, like there's no patient information that's submitted here. It's all anonymous. So we don't know who any of the patients are to protect everyone's confidentiality. And of the 68 patients, about 82% of them had the acetylcholine receptor antibodies and 13% were, uh, were seronegative. And you can see that cases have been reported throughout North America, um, as well as um, uh, some cases from Europe and one, one from Japan as well. And um, you know, one of the things that, that has come out of this and one of the questions we often get is what is the risk of someone who has myasthenia if they get COVID-19? And, you know, you know, based on the data that we have, and we need to, you know, state up front that this is very preliminary in a small number of patients, um, but it's, it appears to be quite serious. So up to this point, about 24% of the patients that have been reported have, have died, um, which is higher than, than the, the, you know, what we would expect from the general population. But just to emphasize this point, we need to be very cautious about this because it's a small number, and it's very likely that there's bias in how these, these data are reported. You know, the people who are reporting them are more likely to report the, the people that didn't do well rather than the p patients that did okay. So this is another reason why we're trying to get word out as far and wide as we can to get as many of these cases reported so that we have the best possible data um, in the future. Uh, and follow-up question to that is, do you know the ages of the patients, Jeff? 
the age. Yes, yeah, we do. We do have the the ages of the page of the patients. I don't have that um, up here prepared, but it's um, it's generally an older population. You know, over the age of fifty um, uh, are the patients that that have um, gotten COVID-19 so far. And, but that kind of matches the population of patients that have myasthenia um, in general, if you look at, look at everyone together. Okay. So we're, I'm gonna move on to the next um, topic, Jeff, but I really wanna thank you for giving this research update tonight. You shared so much great information that I know is very helpful for our community. And I really want to acknowledge that we, we do um, have quite a few questions, medical questions, and I promise everybody that we will record all of the questions and send those out with answers so you, that you do have those, um, as well as all of the slides, any materials um, that we shared during these meetings, you will receive those as well. So thanks so much, Dr. Gupil. I really appreciate um, you joining and reporting out tonight. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So um, next, we're going to actually move and speak with our four officers of our board of directors. I'm so excited that they are able to join us for the town halls this time around. Um, and I know they're equally excited to talk with all of you. On our last town hall meeting, um, the staff and I gave an update on our strategic plan. Um, and we are in the process of operationalizing that plan. Um, but our, our four um, board officers are on tonight and they're going to talk to you a little bit about different pieces of that plan and what they're really excited about with regards to the future for MGFA, um, our future of MGFA. So joining us tonight is Nancy Law, who is the previous CEO of the organization. I know a lot of you know Nancy and she currently serves as our board chair. Brian Gladden, she just waved. Brian Gladden, who serves as our vice chair. Bill Sarwine, who he just waved. <laughs> Bill Sarwine, who serves as our treasurer, and Denise Rossi, who serves as our secretary. So Brian is actually going to lead us off. He's going to give you a summary of the strategic plan because we know not everyone was on our last town hall in July. So I'm just going to turn it right over to him. And Brian, I'm going to get the slides up. Great. Th thank you, Nance. Thank you, uh, Sam. Appreciate it. And we'll, uh, we'll go to the first page. I, it, it's great to be with everyone today. Um, I'm excited to get the opportunity to share with you some of the outputs from the work that we did uh, over the last year on our strategic plan. Um, you know, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about process and how we did it. Uh, I'll summarize the learnings that we had from the process, and then we'll talk about priorities and next steps and how we take this forward and use it as really the basis to, to drive MGFA into the future. So um, this first page is really what we did. It's the process. And I would say, you know, just we started last summer. This process went on for about six months. Um, very involved. We had a broad team engaged in the, in the process. We had multiple board members. We had some volunteers. We had uh, a great chance to use some external consultants. Uh, we used the Bain and Company who is a world-class world uh, consulting company that has the ability to donate their time, and they did that for this project. So we, we benefited from that, and, and uh, it really did help our, our project uh, along. Um, we had a big focus this time, and, and, and I think different than what we've historically done for MGFA, uh, in, in listening to the outside voices uh, and stakeholders. So we spent a lot of time reaching out and, and connecting with key stakeholders across the population of patients and caregivers and clinicians and researchers and uh, various companies that, that support the, the, our community. Uh, we also worked hard to try and make sure we were really listening uh, with a view around what could be the long-term um, dynamics around MGFA. And you know, we, we talked a lot about it during our process. What, what would it, what's it gonna be like in 10 years? And what do we need to do today to be in position to uh, optimize MGFA to, to support this community for that period of time and, and get ahead of some of those dynamics? So um, it was very much, again, outside in and listening. You can see on this chart the four things that we did. We did a broad survey. Many of you probably participated in that. We had 850 responses. 
Uh, we did uh, deeper interviews with a subset of, of key stakeholders and about 60 of them that lasted 45 minutes to an hour. Uh, some of that was done by the external consultants for, to, to get an independent perspective, but again, very helpful. We did a deep dive on the financial performance and trajectory of the foundation. And, and then finally, we, we benchmarked against other similar foundations who deal with chronic uh, conditions and diseases and talked to four other foundations who've had some level of success. And then we learned a lot from, you know, kind of what they've been through. So it was a, a very uh, thoughtful process. And I think, um, you know, we were really happy with, with what we were able to get through as part of it. Go to the next page, Sam, if you can. Um, so just to summarize, these are really the 12 points that I would share in a, in a summary way, um, you know, what we learned in the process. And I'd start out by saying that the, the feedback we heard consistently uh, from all of our stakeholders was very, very positive. Um, you know, we asked for, uh, you know, specific rankings and, and quantitative um, assessments of our performance, and it was all very, very, very positive. There was a lot of very positive recognition around the progress that MGFA has made over the last three years, four years, um, and really evolved this organization into, uh, into what it is today. Uh, we talked, you know, our mission and the key strategic activities that we've been focused on uh, were actually very well aligned with what our stakeholders wanted from us, and, and most of them were very highly supported. Um, we have, as you, as you may know, over the last five or seven years, dramatically improved the financial position of the foundation. Um, however, we did, did note during the strategy work that we are taking on a lot of, uh, of uh, efforts and many projects and we're spread thin in some areas. And I think that forced us to take a step back and think about, are we doing all the things we need to do? We did hear from all the stakeholders that the activities we're driving are, are important and valued. And one of the things that I would say we walked away with, we shouldn't cancel anything or stop doing anything. We have to keep doing what we're doing. So that pushes us to the point where we should get better at fundraising. And you know, when we benchmark our performance around fundraising, the diversity of revenue sources and where we get those donations, um, we have more to do. And, uh, you know, that's a big focus for us to expand that population of, of um, you know, fundraising sources and, uh, and, and dramatically improve our fundraising. Um, research was resoundingly important to everyone. And, and across the board, we heard from all of the stakeholders that, you know, that there's a lot to do in research and that should be a primary focus for MGFA. Um, and it has been. And I would say as we move forward, you'll see as we kind of talk about the new strategy, that's going to be a, a renewed focus and a bigger priority. And, and as you know, there's a lot of energy and, and activity there, as Jeff talked about. Um, you know, it does, that, that opportunity around research and drug development, it does create opportunities for us to access new sources of funds and, and further our broader mission. And that, that's something we will continue to work on. Um, our population of stakeholders, whether it's patients or caregivers, um, broadly is increasingly engaging with MGFA online. They're using our website. They're relying on emails and social media. They want to use our uh, MyMG app, the mobile app. Um, and those are all things that we need to continue to evolve and invest in. Uh, we need to bring improved connectivity and quality of care for remotely located patients. There's a lot of our population that isn't near some of the bigger uh, healthcare systems that has, you know, some of the expertise around MG treatment. And that's something we need to figure out how to better <clears throat> educate that, that population of clinicians, but also bring information to those patients too. Um, MGNet is really a game changer. And the scale and scope of, of that program that Jeff mentioned um, is really, really the biggest thing that's happened to MG. Um, and, you know, we need to be linked to that and ensure that we're aligned and working on projects that, that uh, fit well with what's going on with MGNet and not, not getting in the way with each, of each other. Um, technology in general is an opportunity for us. Um, we have, as you, you've seen, upgraded our website in the last uh, six or eight months. And that has been very positively received. I think it was very well done. Um, as you know, the M MyMG uh, mobile app is, uh, is not a great uh, application and, and needs some work. And that is a priority that the staff and, and a couple other members of the board are, are working on now. You, you can expect to see some, um, 
new technology in that world over the, over the, over the coming months. And then finally, as you think about our staffing model, as MGFA has grown, as we become more professional, um, it's important that we evolve our staffing model, think about how the board works, think about how our committees are structured and how we get work done. Um, and that's, uh, that's something that uh, Sam and her role has begun to address and it's driving some change and churn in our organization, but we think it's, it's absolutely the right thing to do. So those are the, the key messages that we heard. Again, we were all very, very uh, uh, proud to hear the positive feedback for MGFA and, and, and you know, that's something we can build on. Um, this is the chart that summarizes the vision, mission, and the, and the key strategies. Um, and you'll recognize a lot of this. I mean, the, the vision is the same, a world without MG. Uh, our mission, we added to this, uh, you know, we added improving care. Uh, and then the strategies, you'll see we put research at the top of this, not only into um, underlying causes uh, and, and searching for a cure for MG, but also in innovative treatment uh, therapies and techniques for MG. Um, we, 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 we've evolved some of these other statements to include some language, you know, creating more online capability to connect with our communities, do some of the same things we've always been doing, but leverage technology as much as we can. Um, you know, really addressing the remote geographies and stakeholders that may not be local in, in some of our larger cities. And then uh, raising awareness and, and, and doing that through many of the things that we've historically done, but adding a more thorough and complete communication strategy. So those are additions that we had to the strategies that you would have seen in the past as a result of this strategic work. Uh, these nine things are, in summary, the, the priorities that we discussed as a board that we want to um, rally around and drive forward. So these are the actions that you'll see us driving. Number one is diversifying our revenue sources and, and finding a way to become better at fundraising and, and generate more fuel to support these programs and to support the, the, the mission of our, uh, of our organization. Um, key strategic partnerships, there's a lot of opportunities there, picking the right ones, doing them the right way, um, in a way that uh, creates value for not only us, but also our partners is, is really what we need to do. Uh, we talked about supporting provider education in, in, in several areas, uh, coordinating and aligning with MGNet, making sure we're fully synced and driving the, the, the same direction. Um, Prioritizing research and, and making sure that we find ways to increase the funding um, and in some ways structure our research funding uh, mechanisms in a way that, that better facilitates success in, in research. Um, we want to leverage technology and invest in technology that helps us uh, with our mission. We're going to build a better marketing and communications capability and we've already added uh, staff resources to support that and that'll be a, a big change for us. The number eight here is, is really a, an opportunity that I think over time, there is a, a lot of activity that's uh, going on around MG around the world. And, and I think many organizations that have similar missions to what we're doing in other parts of the world, and, and there, while there is some uh, level of connectivity in the scientific and clinical communities, I think uh, the organizations can work together better. And, and we're in a, in a good place to to help bring some of that to bear and, and to help drive some of that. And that's something that we'll talk about as a board over time. Uh, how do we get more leverage from that global community that's, that's, that's um, focused on MG? And then finally, as, as we talked about, really re-looking at our models around how we serve our stakeholders, doing that in the most efficient way and the lowest cost way, but also in the way that works most effectively. And uh, as you know, there's some transitions going on in, this, in our models. And, um, you know, some of that's creating change, but, but that's the right thing to do. And we feel like we're headed down the, uh, the right path there. So these are the key actions that you'll hear more about as we move forward. And then lastly, you know, as, we, as, as, as Sam mentioned, we are in the process of turning this into an operational plan. You know, what are the specific actions we're going to take as we head into 2021 that begin to put us on the path for this strategic plan? Uh, and this is a framework that Sam came up with to really talk about how we're going to do it in these three big pillars. You know, impact is really making sure that we're measuring our success and we're holding ourselves accountable. Growth is about really driving the diversification of the revenue portfolio, and that enables a lot of the things that we want to do. And then the movement is really how we mobilize our people to support uh, this mission. So this is a framework that, again, you'll hear from us more in the future, 
And uh, we feel great about the, the, the process we went through to create this strategic plan. Um, we look forward to continue to bring you updates as we move down the path with this strategy. Um, and and um, with that, I think I'll hand it off to, uh, to our chair, to, uh, to Nancy Law. And thank you, Sam. And thank you, Dova, for uh, Dova holds the power of giving giving me a microphone. So thanks very much there. Um, you know, I, it's um, it's wonderful to see this plan beginning to come together. And as we're moving research forward, we remember that we're also about quality of life for people with myasthenia gravis, and that. You know, for every day, it matters to each of us um, that we want to live our best lives with MG. So um, we face daily challenges and um, our programs and services and our mission around that is really about facing those challenges. We believe that nobody should have to face MG alone, even in a pandemic. And so while the pandemic has certainly changed the way we work, it's not change our, changed our goals, nor has it changed our sense of urgency. So MGFA is really the premier source of MG information for, for patients in the world. Um, and as, this, as we saw the regular things that we were doing, our plans to bring people together at a national conference kind of go up in flames with all of the changes, um, we, we uh, began to embrace that goal of leveraging technology that Brian talked about. And we all had a crash course in Zoom. And I, I wanna give particular shout out to our support group leaders, many of whom had never tried this kind of technology before, but they have taken to it like ducks to water. And we've really been able to continue to bring people with MG together through our online support groups, um, through virtual conferences. And so our, our own national conference, which was a month out when um, COVID struck. Um, we were able to convert to an online event and that's where the surprise came in. Um, we had expected about 300 people in person at our national conference. We saw almost 1500 people from 42 countries. And so, you know, some of this, if there's a silver lining to this, um, this terrible time we've been through um, with the coronavirus, it has um, certainly helped us to understand better ways to communicate with our, with our community and to hear from you. So um, we, we look also, as, as I mentioned, our website is an important vehicle for us to get information out to you, as is social media. We have about 15,000 followers just on our Facebook page, and we're seeing, um, you know, I, it's the place people go to look for updates. I think sometimes even more than on our website um, that they look there first and because it pops up on your mobile devices. Um, so our Zoom support groups, our conferences, and our connections to the world. Um, through, this, um, through this time, we have also been reaching out and talking to other MG organizations, finding out what, what people in other countries are doing. So it's been an exciting time for us. Um, and, and I think there's more to come as, as we're learning new techniques. Um, of course, we also um, invest in supporting patients and families living with the day-to-day -day challenges. And so um, I'm gonna turn things over to my colleague, Denise, who's a medical social worker and you know, very familiar with um, what it takes to live with a chronic illness and, and find your best um, life management strategies. Thank you, Nancy. So yes, as a, a social worker, I do have a passion for helping people finding the strategies to manage life and, uh, and, and, and a chronic illness um, such as MJ. Um, and I, I'm very proud of what MGFA has done in patient outreach. And, and I'm really very excited about how the new organization positions us to expand and enhance our, our patient support. Um, if you've seen the wellness webinars, um, then you probably share my excitement, um, but Gina is going to give a um, more detailed update on the wellness webinar. So I'm not um, going to spend a lot of time talking about that, but I just, you know, if you haven't been able to participate, um, I, you, I 
I advise you to, and um, it's been very well received. In terms of symptom management, um, in addition to funding the consensus treatment guidelines, we, um, MDFA provides information, you know, on, on how to um, deal with treat the symptoms as well as, you know, um, the side effects. Um, and so um, we are positioned to um, expand our, our support of the, the helpline and we're looking at what way, better ways we can serve the um, community through the, um, the helpline and our, the email outreach. Um, and that's by, you know, adding expertise and maybe being better able to address some of the other requests that um, you have in terms of um, community resources and, and information about dealing with things like um, government benefits. So um, one of the things, though, that um, you will also be able to connect through the helpline with is to MG Friends. And MG Friends is a very um, successful, it's a peer support network, um, and it gives patients and the ability to connect one-on-one -on -one with someone who has um, walked in your shoes. Um, and so it's very effective with the newly diagnosed. Um, and it's um, one of the things we're also looking to continue to grow that and be able to provide support but also perhaps um, looking at ways we can provide similar support for um, our caregivers. Nancy, I'm gonna turn it back to you. Well, thank you. And, um, you know, Brian talked about the, the in-depth surveying and the, uh, the listening that we did to the MG community. And of course, not surprising, research was at the top of the list. Um, both, both for better understanding the disease itself, but also, of course, leading to new and better treatments. But the other thing we heard was about healthcare. And certainly we have, and we heard uh, wonderful things from people who are treated by our MG specialists, those, those doctors that we count on, like Jeff Guptill, like several others that I've seen um, on, this, on this call and on the previous call who even tuned in um, to listen. But we couldn't have more dedicated experts in MG, and they give an incredible amount of time. But what we heard from you was that's not the case everywhere. And um, we heard a lot about how the, the healthcare professionals that I run into on a day-to-day -day basis do not know enough about myasthenia gravis. My primary care physician doesn't really understand MG. Um, my, uh, if I have to go to the emergency room, they ask me to spell myasthenia. You know, if I'm in a rural area, you know, the neurologist that I have access to, you know, doesn't, doesn't really have any training. He maybe had, you know, a day on my senior gravis or a half a day in medical school a long time ago, if, if we were lucky. Um, and we hear too about general um, neurology practices in, you know, in cities and small cities and, and even some large ones where um, there's really nobody in that practice. It may be the best practice in the city in neurology, but they don't have um, really any expertise in, in myasthenia. And finally, you know, the importance of that eye doctor, who may be the person who realizes double vision isn't just about the eyes, that the double vision could really um, be a sign or that droopy eyelid um, could, could be an alert um, for, for um, MG. So, you know, these are targets for us, and, uh, and we're really, the, as the staff is looking at the plan, they're really beginning to figure out what are the strategies, what are the best ways we can reach them. And we have, again, uh, right before um, COVID struck, we had just launched a kind of a lunch, lunch a, a dine and learn program, whether it be lunch or dinner. Um, MGFA was like, we'll, we'll pay for the meal. And one of our experts um, was willing to go and talk to a practice or bring together a group of, of local neurologists who just wanted to know, uh, you know, just get some more knowledge about the basics of treating myasthenia gravis and get an update, especially in this changing world that we have where, um, where we can, are in the exciting place of really understanding more about management and treatment.
So, you know, we, uh, we had just launched that, Dr. Yubing Lee from Cleveland Clinic had gone in and talked to a group of, of neurologists in Allentown, Pennsylvania. So, and we had several others beginning to line up. And then, of course, um, the whole idea of in-person um, wasn't really possible. But we were, we've also been talking about using today's technology, another way that lever leveraging technology um, is, can improve lives for people with MG, to create something which is a, a hub and, called a hub and spoke strategy, where you have an expert who reaches out um, to a number of, of people, um, um, healthcare providers in the country who are interested um, who may be seeing some people with MG and interested le in learning more. So we're exploring some different models that may work. We've seen this work in other rare disease. We think there's some real potential here. So we've heard you and we know we've got um, some work to do to make sure that your overall health care um, improves. So I, I think that's it for, for, for me. It's uh, some exciting things happening uh, that I'm really excited about. Um, it's my pleasure to turn things over to the man who keeps an eye on the money, a very important guy, um, Bill Sauerwein, who's our treasurer. Talk to us a little bit about the, you know, the financial status of, of MG and, um, and what, what other kinds of things that we're working on. So Thank Bill, you, over to you. Thank you. But before I start, I have to apologize that my voice breaks up. I'm dealing with a bad case of laryngitis as a result of some allergies. So I'll do my best. It's pollen season. <laughs> my name is Bill Sauerwein. I am served four years on the EFG, MGFA Board of Directors. <clears throat> and I was reelected to the board this past April. I'm delighted to be able to participate in this MGA, MGFA, <clears throat> excuse me, town hall tonight. Because we have a full agenda, I will keep my remarks brief. The future of MGFA has never been brighter than it is today, thanks in part to our CEO, Sam, and the very talented professional staff that she has been able to assemble. I should also like to point out that the while other companies, large and small, were furloughing employees, MGFA was adding staff to improve and enhance our internal operations. MGFA is actually growing and expanding in a very positive and exciting way. Also contributing to the success is the input from our dedicated board of directors, both past and present, volunteers and local sponsors. Without their collective efforts, continued success would not be possible. This unprecedented pandemic, pandemic that we are all experiencing has taken a toll on the members of the MG community, including the activities of the MGFA. While most of the country was on or approaching lockdown, the staff at MGFA was able to create virtual national and international conference that allowed for a wide range of participation. This conference was a huge success and the feedback was extremely positive. The number of attendees for this conference increased dramatically over prior years. Today, the use of virtual communications has become an integral part of MGFA this technology has enabled our new professional staff to reduce expenses by pivoting to virtual meetings, programs, and fundraising events. I'm pleased to report that while the financial markets have been on a roller coaster ride over the last several months, MGFA continues to be on a very sound and solid financial footing. At the beginning of the COVID-19 explosion, a decision was made to take a very conservative position with regard to our investment portfolio. This turned out to be the right approach. We are currently in a position that will allow us to fund existing research grants, as well as provide funding for future grant requests and continue to fund new innovative future programs. While we continue to explore new sources of revenue, we are very much appreciated, appreciative to the generous financial contributions from the MG community 
and our loyal sponsors. I'd like to take a look at some of the positive accomplishments that have occurred in the first six months of this year under the leadership of our CEO and her staff. We were able to replace an expensive service company that was previously handling our operations with an in-house staff. Our in-house staff and professional management team has since taken over and this will improve efficiency and reduce operating cost. Number two is we were able to design a strategic plan under the guidance of Brian that will provide a blueprint for the continuing growth of the M F MGFA and take the foundation to another level. Number three, project an increase in the 2020 revenue by reducing costs and establishing new income streams. Number four, we acted instead of reacting to the potential financial ramifications at the beginning of the COVID-19 by reducing expenses, adjusting for revenue shortfalls, while also searching for other sources of income. As a result of these actions, I'm pleased to report that we are projecting an increase in our 2020 budget revenues. Number five, we've adopted the use of virtual technology to improve the communications and fundraising efforts. And number six, last but not least, and I'm sure there are many others, but last but not least, we created a new level of excitement at MGFA with all the new positive changes that are taking place. Sam, do you have a, uh, some slides that you'd like to bring up? Uh, financial health and national trends. The national giving trends are delineated on the left side of the screen. As you can see, there has been a 6% decrease in the quarter one of this year in individual giving. The nonprofit sector could potentially experience a revenue loss of 25 billion in 2020, which we uh, were part of. Down at the bottom, it just explains that the large organizations are losing almost 50% of their fundraising. By contrast, if you look over at our side on the MGFA side, you'll see that our budget is going to exceed expectations in terms of revenue. Our staff has pivoted to a virtual programming and events which will enhance our operation by uh, enabling us to do some new fundraising activities and keep in touch with our, our members. Walks are projected to be down 25% in comparison with the national average, uh, as opposed to a 46% decrease with the national average. So we're at 25% versus 46%. So that's actually a positive, even though it's a 25% decrease. The program was actually expanded with the additional, with the addition of wellness series, a new research series that will be rolled out in the coming months. Facebook fundraising projected to exceed the budget by 25%. That's a fairly large number. And then due to strategic in initiatives, MGFA has been able to bring professional staff in-house and better position the organization for growth. And I think you're seeing the results of that as we speak. To summarize, MGFA is successfully navigating through this unfortunate pandemic. This is truly good news in an otherwise bad news environment. We at MFN, M, e, MGFA are encouraged that we will continue to enjoy favorable success going forward, thanks to the unwavering support of our MG family and the continued support of our local sponsors. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. I really just wanna take a moment out to thank our four um, board officers for sharing some of their thoughts with all of you this evening. So I wanna thank um, Nancy and Brian and Bill and Denise. I thought that was really important to have them come on tonight and speak with our community members and share some of their excitement and enthusiasm around the future. Um, I especially want to thank Brian because he did lead the efforts on the strategic plan to bring Bain in 
um, and the Inspire team. And it is really one of the most amazing strategic plans that I've seen. Um, we're in the midst of operationalizing it, which is another big lift. Um, but I mean, gosh, guys, over 850 surveys conducted and all those interviews, it's just amazing. And I hope you feel that that strategic plan, when you, and we'll continue to share it out with you, really does reflect all of your feedback. It does really reflect our community. So that's really a beautiful thing. Um, and Bill, I, I hope you feel so much better. I know you're not feeling well, so thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, that just stinks when you're not feeling well. So we, we have two more updates. Um, they're updates that are gonna be given by the staff. Um, they are pretty quick updates. Again, we wanna be cognizant of time. We really appreciate you guys hanging in there with us. But I hope you really enjoyed the updates that you um, have heard thus far. Again, I really hope that you guys see yourselves in these updates. You know, our four officers just talked about our future. It's our organization, our future. I, I hope that you are equally as proud of the fact that we've been able to maintain business to the best of our ability, given the circumstances, um, and that we're able to keep everyone connected. So that, that is top of mind for us every single day. Um, so now, Jenna Mavalo is going to join us. She's going to talk to us a little bit about programming, in particular, our wellness series, which is a brand new program we rolled out about five weeks ago. And for those of you who have not had the pleasure of meeting Jenna yet, she works in partnership with um, Build 11, and she is the Director of um, Patient Advocacy and Community Engagement. So I think probably quite a few of you have worked with her. Um, and Jenna, I'm just going to get your slides up right now. Okay, thanks, Sam. Yeah. Here you go. I'm going to quit. I'm going to talk real quickly about our wellness series. I'm going to cover what the series is, the presentations that we've had already, upcoming webinars, and where you can access all the information that we have about these. So the wellness series was created in response to COVID and the unique set of challenges that it's creating for the MG community. It's a series of webinars designed to connect, educate, and empower the MG patients, care partners, and medical professionals. So on the next slide, we're gonna show you the four presentations that we've had so far. All of these are available on our website, and in a couple of slides, I'm gonna show you where you can find them. The topics we've had so far are staying calm when the world is not, MG and occupational therapy, IVIG standard of care during COVID, and exercising and staying active at home. What's unique about these presentations is that each one is given by a guest speaker who's an expert in the field. They give a 20 minute presentation on the topic and then we allow about 20 minutes of time for Q&A so that the participants on the recording and the webinar are able to actually ask the guest speaker their questions and have them answered during the webinar. Um, so if you haven't attended, oh, can you go back one? If you haven't attended a webinar or if you have and you want to see what ones we have coming up ahead, here's the list. This Friday, we have an uh, preparing for a telemedicine call, and then we have some additional ones lined up as well. So if you're interested in registering for the upcoming webinar, you can do so a couple of different ways. Um, on our website, we have designed a landing page. Can you go to the next slide? Thanks. We've designed a landing page for the wellness series. If you don't want to type this whole address into your browser, you can also just go to the MGFA homepage and you can click on this link that's on the homepage banner. It might not be the first picture that you see because the banner does revolve, but once it shows up, you can click on the learn more button and it'll direct you to the wellness series webpage. On the webpage, you can register for the upcoming webinar. And once you do that, you'll be given the meeting info. After you do that, you can scroll down on the page and it'll have all of the webinars that have been recorded and loaded on the website. So if you weren't able to attend one of our past webinars, but you really wanted to, you can now go there and watch it. Additionally, if you attended the webinar, but maybe you want it to go back and get some more information that you might have missed or you didn't get to capture, 
you can go back there and you can view the slides during the presentation as well. MGFA is sending out weekly emails about these webinars. If you think that you should be getting these emails and you're not, I suggest you check your spam folder. If you are not getting the emails that you would like to, you can sign up to be a part of the MGFA email list. This will give you access to the emails about the webinars in addition to all of the MGFA updates that we send out via email. We also post information about these webinars on social media as well. So there's a couple of different ways you can find it. Um, I wanted to say thank you to everyone who's participated in the webinars. I want to invite everyone to join the rest of them. We have them running through the end of September. And I wanted to thank our sponsors who are supporting this series as well. And that's it, thanks. Yes, sorry, I was <laughs> trying to come off on mute. And that just added to all the insults of how badly I ran your slide. So I'm sorry, I know I get it like a C or D for that, Jen, and I apologize for messing you up a little bit, sorry. Um, all right. So here's the thing, like there's in our next up, in our next and final update is gonna be on event fundraising. There's so much more going on in way of programs and fundraising. We just really on these town halls want to talk to you about what's going on right now and what's really current and relevant. Um, we also are trying to be very cognizant of time. So Jenna, thank, I know you and Dover are doing so much more than the wellness series, but thank you so much for sharing that update. If you have not had the pleasure of joining a, a session yet, they're every Friday. They're amazing. The speakers are dynamic. The information's fantastic. Please, please join them. Um, so next, Sam Gardner, who's our director of fundraising, is going to talk to you about our um, Together We Stand event. We are actually in our fundraising season right now. And um, because we cannot have the in-person walks, we are having this event um, and Sam's gonna talk to you about it. And so we really hope that you all can join us for, for, this, um, for this event, this celebration. So Sam, I'm just gonna get your slides up and ready. Thank you. Yeah, as Sam's doing that, I'll go ahead and just start. Um, so we are super excited about the Together We Stand virtual fundraising event that's coming up on Saturday, October 10th. Um, we're gonna be highlighting all things MGFA, um, doing some live uh, interviews. We'll be sharing some videos of fundraising events that are taking place from now until that October 10th timeframe. We'll also share some research updates and there'll be much, much more. I want to thank the committee of volunteers that have helped us put together the content for this virtual event. Um, and they've also created a couple fun contests that I want to share with you uh, that'll be coming up here in the next few days. So you can be watching for those. One is the Together We Stand art contest. And the other is the Together We Seek and Find scavenger hunt. So there'll be more information shared about those um, via email and through social media posts. So please watch for those so you can participate leading up to the October 10th event. We also have a volunteer, uh, Jessica Zimmerman, who created a virtual DIY event called the Lucky Ducky Derby. And this fundraising event um, will um, go, the proceeds for that will go toward the uh, Together We Stand event. And we're really excited to um, share that with you all. So you can um, go to the link once the slides are sent out and check out that website and get involved by either starting a duck derby team or um, buying your own flock of ducks. Um, other ways that you can help support the Together We Stand event are um, by hosting a birthday Facebook fundraiser. A lot of people are doing that right now, so it's um, something fun and really easy to participate in. You can also start a virtual walk team. Um, the walk website is still open, so if you've had a team in the past, you can go there, start your team up again, get them reactivated and motivated to help out um, in supporting the Together We Stand event. You can also host a Zoom fundraiser. Um, like I said, you can join the D Lucky Ducky Derby, um, or you can create your own DIY fundraiser. And if you need help with setting up any of these um, fundraising events, you can certainly reach out to me uh, via phone or email, either one and all. I'd be more than happy to help you get started. 
Um, we also would love for you to spread the word with your friends and family. This is a fundraising event and we ask that everybody participate if you can. Um, and um, you can go to either the myasthenia.org website or the MG Walk website and you'll find the information to prove together we stand there. Um, I do want to mention that we have had a very generous donation from Premier Lawn and Landscape. They are going to match the first $10,000 that's raised for the month of August for this virtual event. So we're super excited and grateful for that, that um, generous donation. So um, all of the fundraising efforts that we have um, going on from now until October 10th, whether it be through the virtual walks, the duck derby, Facebook fundraising, or anything that you create on your own, that total will be announced on October 10th at the virtual event, Together We Stand. And so we hope you will join us um, that Saturday morning or Saturday afternoon for some of you um, on October 10th. And we thank you in advance for all of your support for the MGFA and all the fundraising that you do throughout the year. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Sam. Okay, great. Thanks, Sam. Um, so I, I too just wanna take a real quick second to um, sincerely thank the committee Every time Sam comes back and gives us an update at a team meeting on Tuesday, it's, it's like it gets better and better. This committee is just so, so creative and so invested and dedicated. And, um, you know, from the art contest to the Seek and Find, Jessica's um, Lucky Ducky Derby is amazing. So definitely take a moment to check that out and buy some duckies and um, say that. 10, say that fast 10 times, Lucky Ducky Derby, that's very hard to say. Um, but thank you so much to the committee members for your time and your dedication, certainly. That can go above and beyond. So those are all of our updates. I do want to thank you all again for taking time out of your evening. Um, certainly hosting the town hall, like I said at the beginning of the call, this forum is a very, very special forum. It's, um, it's what we have right now. It's the best we can do to get together. So I'm so glad that you were able to join us. And thank you for taking the time out to listen in and, and just you know telling us that it was important to you. Um, aside from the questions that I get in advance, I did get a number of emails from some of you. So thank you for those very kind emails and saying that you love that we're doing the town halls and um, you, you love how connected you feel. And we just really, we really appreciate that from the bottom of our hearts. So thank you for that. Um, we will, as follow-up, send out all of the materials, all the slides, all of the questions with answers. We don't need to wait for town halls. Should you have any questions or have feedback or want to reach out, you should always feel that you can do that. We're a very small staff. The door is always open and the lines of communication are always open. So, so please take advantage of that. Um, thank you. And uh, we will send out the date for our next town hall, which will be in a few months um, soon. So thanks for joining us and take care, everyone.